Hello everyone, Axfords here, and welcome to Jojolian Chapter 95 Review and Discussion. And be sure to pay attention, because Jojolian Review will by far be the most important online class you are taking during this quarantine, and this will be on the test next week. So getting right into it, we are entering a new arc titled Endless Calamity. So we're out of dangerous pursuit, as we're not really pursuing the head doctor, at least we're not through Josuke's perspective right now. He's still at the hospital, and we're more so focused on the gosh, you got a family. And calamity is a great word to explain what is happening at the estate right now. But it's also in reference to the head doctor stand as uh, Mitsuba has used Calamity multiple times to describe its ability. So I don't believe Endless Calamity is gonna be the stand's name or anything. It's just a good term to describe what is happening in this part. Just endless chaos, everything is falling apart. And the cover page is Josuke Higashikata, a nice highlight of his redesign, which I still love, still looks amazing. But uh, Josuke is not in this chapter at all. So honestly, I would have liked to see a Jobin chapter cover because those are pretty rare. And Jobin is definitely the main focus of this chapter as we will see later on in the review. So jumping right into it, we come off where we left off at the end of chapter 94, where Mitsuba was trying to flush Yasuo down the toilet and her awakened three leaves, one of her arrows was redirected because of Endless Calamity or uh, the head doctor's stand, which shot it into the wall where Jobin was hiding the new Rokakaka and is exposed to the entire Higashigata family what Jobin has done. So Jobin is out in the open, he can't hide anymore. He has to explain to Norisuke how he got this branch and what he's been doing. And he's really straightforward about it. He just tells Norisuke that during the fire in the orchard, him and Surugi worked together to get the branch and they're now growing it. And he sort of continues to explain his motivation. But Norisuke is also a massive part of this chapter and as he breaks in and sees what is going on and that Josuke has the, the fruit being grown he immediately springs into action he's sort of the voice of reason throughout this entire part and he has he has like the most noble sense of justice out of all the Higashigata family members so he immediately saves Yasuo he notices what's happening grabs her out of the toilet thank god Yasuo is finally safe thank you Norisuke and after Norisuke saves Yasuo you see this demeanor on Jobin's face which is very villainous and that's represented on him throughout this entire chapter which really especially in this this chapter makes him seem like an extreme villain. Not throughout the entire part, in the grand scale of things, I think the head doctor still has a few tricks up his sleeves, a few reveals that are going to be big twists, but for now, Jobin is definitely taking up the role of the villain in this part. So as this confrontation between Jobin and Norisuke continues, Yasuo is yelling out to put Paisley Park near an electrical outlet so she can come back to her. And then we see through Yasuo's perspective what is happening, and she's just really desperately crawling around the estate, trying to find any sort of, uh, you know, escape from what is happening right now, and she is is greeted by the head doctor. And again, the head doctor is just an enigma. It doesn't make sense why he's by the garage. I believe the last time we saw him was when he jumped off of the balcony and now he's just somewhere else entirely. And uh, yeah, just more allusion to, or it alludes more to the mystery of this character. And it's also very unfortunate that as Yasuo has already gone through all of these troubles and so many things have already knocked into her because of the head doctor, She's greeted once again by the head doctor, so it looks like something, some more things may happen to her. So now we flip back to Jobin and Norisuke, and the intensity wraps up as Norisuke sort of tries to, you know, fit the pieces together, which is ironic because his stand just came nothing, about what is happening with Jobin right now and what his motivation is and what he's been doing this whole time. Again, Jobin explains to him that he got the branch during the uh, fire in the Higashikata estate, and he also explains to Norisuke what he is using the fruit for to save Surugi. And during this confrontation, we get a great monologue from Norisuke that explains the different points of views between Jobin and himself. Norisuke explains that he might think of things very old-fashioned and the way that he would solve the curse is that someone must sacrifice themselves to save Surugi, whether it be him, Jobin, Mitsuba, or really anyone. But after Jobin explains to him what he's using the fruit for and how it will be able to cure them from this curse that's cursed their family for generations, Norisuke says like, yes, Jobin, you may be right, this works, but there's no point of using this method if you're going about it wrong and you're not following the right path. Like, what's the point of solving the curse using this fruit if we're killing innocent people and we're doing terrible things? That's just something Norisuke would never do. And he would sacrifice himself a hundred times before he killed an innocent person in pursuit of solving the curse for his family. So that just kind of reestablishes the person Norisuke is and why he's one of my favorite characters in Jojolian. And he probably has like the strongest sense of justice out of anyone. And as he's explained to Jobin what the right path is and how he sort of disappointed him as a son, we see Kane nothing, which we haven't seen since chapter 30 something, which is really great to see old stands come back. It gives me hope for maybe California came bad, maybe Walking Heart, maybe even Kyo Nijimura will come back, but it's just great to see something that we haven't seen in a while. And Norisuke says, like, on this branch, I smell something, and he uses K nothing. And the way K nothing works, it's pretty much like Moody Blues, but instead of time, it uses smells. It's able to recreate people using the puzzle pieces and show the reaction. So it's pretty much just 
uh, it's a different ability, but it provides the same result as, say, Moody Blues. So what he, he kind of exposes to the entire family that Jobin had killed o Ojiro, but also his girlfriend, which was who was kind of innocent. She didn't really do anything terrible. Obviously, she might not have been the best person, but she didn't go out of her way to like kill anyone or anything like that. And that was probably the most villainous thing Jobin has done in this entire part, besides, of course, hurting Yasuo twice. So Jobin's like, everything's stacking against Jobin right now, and it's sort of being revealed to the family, all the things he's been doing, and uh, it's sort of just making everyone turn against him and putting Jobin in a really bad situation because in his heart, he thinks that what he's doing is right. He thinks he's saving the family, but at the same time, the whole family has seen the method he's gone to achieve this result and it's all going against him. And he's just, in his mind, I can imagine how frustrated he is because he's just like, why won't you guys accept my method? I'm doing this for the family, but you guys are rejecting me. And that eventually boils on to, literally boils onto Norisuke. Uh, Jobin's you know, frustration boils out to Norisuke as he attacks him. So Jobin has been foiled. Everything is falling apart. It is quite literally endless calamity. And Jobin, out of pure reaction, does the only thing he thinks is possible to kind of save her and save what he has been working towards, and that is killing his father, Norisuke. As he spent, sends out Speed Cane, boils his face, and sends him to to the ground. And immediately after this, you can see that Jobin regrets this. He didn't mean to do this intentionally. This wasn't anything methodical. He didn't think that if Norisuke gets in my way, I'll kill him. It was just everything stacking against him. He saw that he was going to not be able to achieve what he wanted to. So out of pure emotion, he just said, I need to stop this. I need to stop my father right now. And he immediately regrets it as he falls to his knees, embraces Norisuke in his arms, crying very similar to Josuke when he met Holly back, which is a good parallel between these two characters, which could also add up to a good villain dynamic if Jobin wants to be main villain. Some parallels and sort of a, a dichotomy between Josuke and Jobin, which I think would be nice. And this panel right here, where Jobin is embracing Norisuke in his arms, grabbing his face in tears, and then the next page is the family reacting to this. This is the endless calamity Araki is referring to in this uh, chapter right here, this chapter title. And this scene right here, I think really differentiates Jojolian from pretty much all of the other parts of Jojo, where there's not a clear villain and a good guy. Obviously, you know, we're in chapter 95 here and we can't even pinpoint if Jobin is going to be the main villain. And unlike, you know, us going after a bad guy and fighting a bad guy, just seeing things tear apart and there being so many more dynamics to it. Like we have the Higashikata family. What is the home life gonna be for them after Norisuke dies? and just this family being torn apart is so much different from just the clear black and white Johnny versus Valentine, Jono versus Diablo that we've had, just the good versus evil in Jojo for so long. And I really love Araki expanding his horizons and writing in new ways. And honestly, if Jojolian doesn't even have an established main villain, I think that could be a good thing and a real evolution for the series and Araki's writing. But Jobin finally composes himself and he doubles down on his decision. He wipes his tears. And as you have, all, while all this is going on, you have Joshu, Hato, and Dai in the background and Tsurugi and Mitsuba watching this happen and watching their father die. And as soon as one of them tries to interfere, Jobin doubles down and he puts Speed Cane out and he says that through his actions, the Higashikata family is moving on the right path. But you can almost see in his expression that he knows he's wrong. But he's just he's just so invested in this uh, plot that he's gone through, trying to get the new Rokakaka. He just he just can't turn back, even if he knows in his heart that he's doing he's going off the he's going on the wrong path. So we finally are coming towards the events that we saw in chapter 83 or 85, I believe, which was the fast forward of Norisuke in the body bag. And also when Jobin attack Norisuke with speed cane. Names are being confused. So many names to follow right now. Um, Norisuke's hand, his right hand broke off, which it doesn't really make sense why speed cane would do that. Speed cane just like sort of affects underneath your skin and makes it really hot. But of course, just to make things confusing, Norisuke's right arm is cut off just like Yasuo's is. And some people have said that this kind of debunks the theory that it was Yasuo in the body bag, but I don't think that's entirely true, because why would Araki, int you know, Araki did not need to write this as Norisuke's arm breaking off. It really doesn't even make sense why Speed King would be able to do that. Now Yasuo and Norisuke both have their right arm split off, so it could be either one of them in the body bag. And again, to refer back to the flash forward chapter in, you know, 83, 85, wherever it was, um, we saw Paper Moon Cane being used, which was, of course, foreshadowing, you know, Araki wouldn't write Paper Moon Cane or Draw Paper Moon Cane if its ability wasn't being used. And it also, going back and rereading that chapter has me thinking, okay, so we see that the entire Higashikata family has seen their father die before their eyes, but in that flash forward, the Higashikata family is fully composed. It looks like everything is normal. They're just playing around, which has me thinking that, uh, you know, this is kind of outlandish, but 
What if we see some sort of bites the dust type ability that sort of puts things back the way they were right before Norisuke died, which would make sense why the, Higashika, why the Higashikata family would be more composed and not freaking out. Because I can't see any way of the Higashikata family in the next like hour or two going back to completely normal and like everything was fine. But Another thing that could be possible is that Daya could use her stand California came bed to remove the memories of when Norisuke died, which is also possible. And in that flash forward, we did see a Rocky Jaw paper or uh, California came bed on like a table or something. So California came bed could be a possibility or it could be some sort of bites the dust type ability or maybe Surugi stand will evolve. There's literally an endless possibility of things that could happen that could bring us to the events of what was happening during the flash forward chapter. So as the dust settles and everyone is so broken up over Norisuke's death and Jobin is loading him into a body bag, Joshu comes out with a playmaker move here and he kicks Yasuo's phone towards an electrical outlet, which is uh, alluded to as you see Joshu's foot and then you see Yasuo was phone sliding and that pretty much saves Yasuo, brings Paisley Park back to him and Jobin sees this so in the next chapter if we're still with the Higashikata family we could see a fight between Speed King and Nut King Call if Jobin is still doubling down on you know going against his family in order to save Surugi which is you know his 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 ideology doesn't even make sense anymore as he's trying to move the Higashikata family forward but at the same time he's completely tearing it apart and he knows this but he can't admit that he's wrong. So Yasuo is saved in a sense as she has Paisley Park back so she'll be able to defend herself more and also since Yasuo lost her right arm Paisley Park is also missing the arm as well which I love when Rocky keeps those continuities and I just noticed that Paisley Park is looking dummy thick in this panel god damn. And the last page of this chapter is pretty much things that have already been said which is Mitsuba's explanation of what she thinks this stance ability is. This is Calamity, the calamity that's been continuing since back then, since she was back at the hospital getting extorted, and up until now, and we see a few pages of the, the estate, Mitsuba, and also the tree where the Higashikata family will perform their equivalent exchanges, which also may be important in some way, but it's pretty much just uh, Mitsuba talking about the calamity that is the head doctor stand, and that brings us to the to be continued sign, and this says, I haven't seen this part, it says, um, it all goes on and on like an endless calamity, but that is going to be chapter 95. I think Araki might bring us back to Josuke's perspective in the next chapter, but if he doesn't and we continue seeing what is happening with the Kashikata family, that would also be great. So I mentioned earlier a bit of my theories about what I could think could happen. I definitely think we're going to see some sort of standability interfere and revert the Kashikata family in some way as they're unaware to what actually happened to Norisuke. Or maybe that chapter like a year ago might be retconned in some way, which I really won't, I, I'd be very unhappy if that happens. I do not want to see that. I want to see that explained and uh, you know why the family goes back to acting normal. A bite to the dust type ability, California Kane Bed's a possibility, or maybe something with Paper Moon Kane or an evolution of Paper Moon Kane. And also, uh, Srugi is going to be healed in some way very soon, as we saw that he was completely fine in that flash forward. And I keep referring to that flash forward a lot because it is canon of what is going to happen next, so it's important to take that into consideration. And it's crazy that Araki wrote that so long ago, and even Norisuke's hand being broken off, and uh, he remembered to write that in and everything in this chapter. So chapter 95 was very good, one of the best chapters of Joe Jolien in a while, and I think it's only going to get better from here. I want to see what Josuke is up to, I want to see if he uh, eventually has his confrontation with the head doctor in the hospital, as he is still waiting, and I want to see what is up with Mamazuku. Is he in prison? We haven't seen him in like three chapters, Araki. I want to know where Mamazuku is. Maybe he'll be like one of those Kakyoin type characters who goes away, and then he comes back to save the day in some way, and everyone will be like, Mamazuku, he's back. Uh, so Araki kind of wrote himself into a uh, uh, a good thing right there, so he'll be able to bring Mamazuku back if he needs someone to save the day. So guys, let me know what you thought of chapter 95 of JoJillian and what your expectations are for chapter 96, which there's no hiatus next month, so we're going to be rolling on this year with JoJillian chapters. So thank you guys so much for watching. Like the video if you enjoyed, subscribe for more, and let me know all your thoughts on this chapter and what is upcoming for the series. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Bye.